Hey everyone, this is Carlos. I'm the CEO at Product School. Today I'm here with Tony Beltramelli, who's the founder at Wizard. Welcome to the show, Tony. Hi, Carlos. Thanks for having me and a uh, pleasure to be here. Tony, timing for this interview is perfect because I, I saw you started your company, Wizard, around seven years ago, and then you announced its acquisition by Miro just last month. That's right. We're joining Miro. Pretty excited about that. Well, I would love to get your thoughts, first of all, on, on, on what is uh, Wizard? Yeah, so that's a good question. <laughs> Wizard is basically uh, an AI-powered UI design tool. Um, and it's not a design tool for designers, um, even though it sounds counterintuitive, but we are a design tool for product teams. So we help essentially product teams go faster from ideation, product discovery, all the way to you know, prototyping and, and UI design. And what is Miro? Miro, of course, if, if there, there's ever a need for an interaction here, is the best, you know, the best innovation workspace out there. You can do whiteboarding, ideation, brainstorming, diagramming, all the good stuff. <laughs> I am very familiar with Miro because they've been partners with Proxul for many, many years. I got to know its founder, Andre, back in the day when the company was relatively small. And today it's incredible to see how big it is. And I'm very happy to see you guys joining forces. I think it makes a ton of sense as, as the space of visual collaboration gets bigger and, and more non-designers are part of it. So, um, we, you know, at the high level, I just want to get your rationale as a founder. Uh, why did you decide to join forces? Well, as I, as I described what Wizard was, as you've heard, like we are serving product teams. And that means that, you know, like when we did a survey, like 85% of our customers were using Miro. And so we felt like, hey, why don't we join, join forces? We can just serve a ton more people, provide more value at scale. So it, it just, it was a, a no brainer, honestly. And you mentioned design for non-designers. And for me, as a, as a non-designer, I, I, I get it. Uh, our audience are all product managers and product leaders. But I remember that not too long ago, there wasn't really much for non-designers. Like we would have to use very complex or advanced tools for designers in order to create a, model, a prototype or, or a mock-up. So what, what was that initial you know, idea that made you go for it over seven years ago? So there was two things. One thing, it was like AI, and we can touch upon this for a minute, why we thought AI was just you know, a, a fantastic new technology to address this problem. But second of all, the why is that like most product teams and PMs specifically, don't see themselves as designers, but every PM does design today already. You know whether you call it project scoping, wireframing, product discovery, ideation, mockup, drafting. All of this is essentially UI design at the end of the day. You you try to just turn some ideas into something a little bit more tangible that you can test with customers, validate hypotheses with with users, and that's kind of like why we tend to say that hey. You are PM, you are actually doing design. You just don't call it design. <laughs> I, I agree. And I, I'm looking at your website and I see how you break down your product into specific stages of design, UX, UI, wireframes, mockups, prototypes. Um, can you explain with more detail what each of them mean? Yeah, so it, the, the interesting thing about this space is that there's a lot of jargon. It's a really he jargon-heavy space, I, I, as you just described with those like five different terms. Uh, all in all, you know, what we're trying to convey by just describing how Wizard helps different phases of that design, you know, problem space is that, you know, you, you want to find a way to just describe the user journey, what our customers or the end users going to go through if they want to, I don't know, order, uh, order potatoes from your uh, online supermarket. That's a user experience like the UX, uh, the user journey. There's also like the way it looks, like how... Would the button uh, look? What would be the border radius, the color? That's the UI design. And, and typically, you know, when you put all, all of it together into some kind of like comprehensive proposal, you, you know, people might, might call it like wireframes. If it's really like low fidelity, it's just like boxes drawn with text. Uh, or people might just, you know, call it high fidelity mockup if there's already some style and theme and so on. And so, and then when it comes to prototyping, Prototyping is just a fancy word that typically means uh, it's a clickable proposal. It's not just a static visual of how my screen of my app would look like, 
but I can actually click through. I can input data in, in, in fields. It, it, it's a prototype. It's a fake real app, if you will. Uh, so that's kind of like, you know, we try to encapsulate all these different concepts and provide a uniform workflow and one tool to help product teams really like just cover all this ground whenever they do product discovery and ideation. And I, to me, I remember when I started my career in product and there was some tools that were doing that, it was, it was hell. Like I remember like product managers were very limited. They couldn't really build by themselves and then unless they had true design skills or engineering skills. And with this low code or even no code movement, we saw it's a whole new generation of technology that is now empowering people like PMs who can really get to the finish line by themselves or close to it and like, explain their ideas or better collaborate with people in, in, in on the com like with a common vocabulary. I think that's been transformational because it ultimately reduces friction and increases the efficiency, right? That right Absolutely. now you can go from something you have in your mind to like having an educated conversation with a designer yeah. within minutes, really. Completely. And that's exactly it, right? Like, you know, they, they, they are fantastic tools out there. Sketch has been one of them. Figma is a new, the new one, like Adobe XD. But the, the common denominator is that these tools are really complex. You, you need to be quite an expert to know, okay, you know, I need to just draw vector graphics and then this eventually will just look like an app. Um, we, we thought that's great for designers, but we just felt like th th there got to be a better way to your point, to just help people take ideas they have in, a, in their heads and we really quickly have something tangible that they can show people. Yeah, and how do you position your product? You mentioned uh, Figma. I, we're still, there's another company like InVision that recently has announced that they are going to sunset. And in fact, the former CEO of, I know it works now at, at Miro with you, so that's, that's funny. Uh, Balsamic has been around for a very long time. Like, How do you position Wizard in the competitive landscape? Yeah, so uh, you know, we started the company in 2018, and we were like really the, the the first one that thought like a better design workflow has to be AI first. And so for a very long time, our differentiator was like Wizard is the AI first, the AI powered design tool for product teams. Um, but of course, like recently, everybody started to do AI. Uh, so the core focus for us has been like, hey, Wizard is easy to use; it's for product teams. And as you know, whether it's, it's easy to use because of AI or because of other underlying technology, it didn't matter anymore. It's like it's easy to use if you don't, are not like a professional designers with 10, 10 years of experience and you just want to just you know ship product faster, align with stakeholders, and, and so on. So that's that has become our new positioning. So what kind of AI stuff were you doing before AI became cool? Yeah. So and and I guess the reason why why would you build a, an AI first design tool, you know, uh, that's something we're being asked a lot in 2018. And taking a step back, if you are trying to just solve a problem for a customer, we think this is like a search problem. There is just probably like millions of different solutions for one specific problems. And one thing AI is extremely good at is pattern recognition and synthesizing huge among us amount of data into concise bits. And so we felt like if design is a search problem, well, then AI can help us explore the search space as a PM, as a product leader, to just try to find solutions faster and help our customers better. So that was the initial assumption of like why we think AI should be part of the solution. And second of all, design is hard, right? You know, not everybody can just become a really successful UI designer overnight. So we felt like AI was also a, a way to lower the bar of entry and level the playing field such that you know, a PM can just start creating stuff that look professional, that are pretty enough to just get feedback from customers without having to spend you know, one, one month of design training uh, to, to, to get started. So that's, that's why we thought AI was just the answer to, to the problem we're, we were trying to solve. So all of that was there kind of before the AI frenzy in the last couple of years, if you will. And I agree, I mean, I've seen a, a pattern with a lot of other no-code tools where first users would log in and in some cases for free, but it was hard to get onboarded and find value faster. And then they started creating templates kind of, or guides, ways for the user to yeah. get to the aha moment as soon as possible. And templates helped, but sometimes weren't enough because template sometimes doesn't fully solve the problem. So they start creating more ways for people to fill out the survey with contextual information. And, and I think that's a lot of where we are today. But as we think about the future, 
what are some of the new AI superpowers that you think can be infused into these type of products? Yeah, I mean, so to give some tangible example of like what AI feature we build in Wizard and why. So we've always felt like, first of all, we don't want to force people to adapt to just the way the product works. We thought that AI could help people, you know, we wanted the technology to adapt to people rather than forcing people to adapt to the technology. And so a, a tangible example of this, uh, as you said before, is like you're searching for a template to get started because you're creating like, I don't know, like a, 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 web, a web SaaS for um, tracking self-driving cars in San Francisco. You might not have the right template for your use case. It's very unique. But using AI, you can actually ge generate something that's pretty close, right? It's not going to be perfect, but you will get like, 75% there. That's one use case that we cover with AI. You can actually just type a prompt of what exactly you want to do, and then AI will just try to come up with you know, um, a rough um, estimate of what it looks like. Five screens to start from. Another use case is like, OK, I've sketched some ideas on the, on the whiteboard with my team during a brainstorming session. No, I'm going to have to recreate this somewhere on my computer to start iterating on it. Well, using AI, you can actually just take a screenshot or a picture of whatever you've created on the whiteboard, and we'll just turn that into an editable design mockup that you can then edit you know, on screen. So this is you know, two examples where we try to both merge the real world with the digital world by using AI as a medium, but also like use AI as a way to just seed, uh, in seed creation. You have an ID, you can type it, and then AI can just help you discover possible solutions. I like that because it's not just about onboarding the user so they can get to value faster. I think it's also providing that value throughout the journey and, and even post journey, as you mentioned, like if you build something on a sketch, like how do you turn that into a actionable prototype? Because it's not that logical, like back in the day, like you have to switch from one tool to another. And still, even though those tools are relatively simple compared to a design tool, as they become more advanced, not all the features are that simple, so I can see how AI can help simplify what's already kind of simple. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's something we joke about about sometimes with customers. Like, there's only so many ways to design a login screen, right? You don't you don't need to recreate it from scratch every single time. You can probably either, you know type a prompt, get something that's pretty good, and and move forward. <laughs> oh my god, that's a good one. So designing with prompts. Yeah, that's one of the key use cases that we've actually launched in 2023. Like uh, th this core engine is called Auto Designer instead of a product, and it's literally like a prompt-based AI design assistant. So as we think about elevating design, making it easier for non-designers, what are some real good ways you've seen for the design teams to, to really be part of this evolution and, and, and ensure that they can drive business value? Because, you know, this this misconception sometimes that, okay, it's the business team or the product team that is making all the decisions and they bring the designers at the end of the process to make something yeah. pretty. And that's exactly kind of like, you know, we, even though we serve product teams, there, there are designers in those product teams. And so we, you know, we do serve designers uh, by, by, uh, by proxy. So, you know, if you are a designer, as you mentioned, you don't want to be brought into the process at the very end. Your goal is not to make things pretty, it's also to, to help solve problems. So I often say that designers are not artists. In, in, in the product designers are not artists, they are, they are visual engineers. They are solving problems through visual languages. And the value of a tool like Wizard is that instead of having them be like the proxy to the PM or the business leaders where you know, they tell them what to do, now the designer can be co-creating together with the PM, together with the decision makers, instead of a safe space, which is wizard, before they go do the high fidelity, pixel perfect design inside of Figma or Sketch or any of the other tools. So we really hope that you know, like by just having everybody at the same table, we can really help designers become that visual engineer, that problem solver, and not be like delegated to just visual AI aesthetic and design style. Another challenge that I've, I faced personally with between designers and, and product teams or product managers is, is that sometimes it's just hard to quantify everything. Like if I'm looking at a, at a dashboard with numbers, it's easier for me to rationalize a decision. But sometimes it's a lot of subjectivity into the, yeah. the design. So when you say visual engineer, I think that, that's, that implies being, being 
not only a thought partner, but also a better better partner to to quantify what's happening or what's the impact and how long it would take and like how good is this. But still, there's so much friction, right? Like someone wants something that is maybe more simple. Someone wants something that is a little more complex. So what are some good ways for you to kind of remove some of that subjectivity and ultimately be able to make a decision that move those teams forward? Well, I, I think one thing that has really helped like a lot of companies is, is the interaction of, of design system. Like if you have a library of components or rules of like, you know, how do we solve that specific onboarding problem? How does a form look inside of our organization? You can actually remove a lot of sub subjectivity because that visual language, these Lego blocks that you use to build solution have already been codified. So, you know, your goal as a product team uh, is to start assembling these Lego blocks into a meaningful solutions, but all of a sudden there is no more argument about, you know, how this should look and how, how the, the shade of blue should be uh, versus green or whatever, you know. And, and that's something that, we, that, that was also like front and center instead of wizard, enabling teams to just take their com component uh, and, and design with them uh, as a library of, of Lego blocks once again, instead of just starting from scratch every single time. There's another leadership principle that I know you're a fan of, which is less is more in design. <laughs> uh, can you elaborate more, please? Yeah, so less is more is 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 really like the uh, you know the uh, the long debate of like Apple versus Android or like Google Search versus Yahoo. You know, they, they, I think we all understand now like what's the easiest way for me as a user to get the job done, and it's really it's so much it's so easy sometimes for leaders, engineers, or people that don't really think from a design thinking perspective to just cramp features into the screen. Like, and, it, and it becomes like unusable for people. And that's kind of like what we mean by less is more. Um, and sometimes as a PM, you need to kill your darlings. If you just place a feature there and it's not used, I mean, why would you keep it, right? Every feature on, in, on your product will basically in, it require maintenance, require a team. It's, it's costs that are sinking into something that might not be worth it. So that's kind of like what we mean by less is more. Think simple and, and don't be afraid to kill your darlings uh, if it means like simplifying the user experience and creating value for the customer you know, in, a, in a better way. That part is so hard though, especially it if is. that darling <laughs> was uh, kind of evangelized by the CEO. Yeah, that's, that's, it's, it's tricky. We've been there before at Wizard and, and in retrospect, I think sometimes we waited too long to kill, to kill our darlings. Uh, can you share a story on something that you had to kill? Oh yeah, that's actually a good one. This one has been hard after the, the aftermath. So for a very long time at Wizard, we thought that the best way to help product teams was also to generate code. Because if you can generate code from your ideation prototyping, you can also enable engineers to do like more had advanced prototyping using code. You can also help people take things to production much faster. So we, we built this really complex and, and expensive to build pieces of, of technology to generate code. But ultimately we realized like our customers don't care. Like they are using this tool for fast iteration, stakeholder alignment, visualizing the IDs. Code doesn't really have as much of a need as we thought, even though we had like collected, you know, user data to just validate that. So we had to kill it. And it was painful because we built, we, it took a while to build, it was expensive to build. The engineers love the technology achievement of building this, but it was just not bringing value to customers and not driving you know, business revenue. So we killed it. But uh, the funny thing that happened is that we had still like demo videos online of people using this feature, us talking about the feature. And so for a very long time, even still today, we have people sometimes coming and like, hey, where can, where can I find the, the code generator? And it's like, oh, we killed it five years ago. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that, that's probably the, the hardest learned story of like, you know, kill your darling before they've been, you know, in, in the world for too long and just, you know, provide the wrong assumption and, and expectation. Uh, let's talk about another tricky one. Uh, word redesign uh, always brings nightmares to some people. <laughs> it, it implies big changes, right? It could oh, be yeah. removing things. It could be adding new things. There's some uncertainty. You don't really know how the user is going to react to something that you think it's better. Um, so I'd love to hear from your own experience of how have you gone through a, a redesign and what are some of those lessons learned? We've done a few redesign in the past. Uh, both our like main websites have been redesigned like eight times, I, would, I think, but the core product has also be, been re redesigned a few times. 
And we always try to do it in a modular fashion, which is like, if if this if the redesign is not like changing every single pixel, there's probably a, a case to make that you will just modify things in a modular fashion, right? You you will change the let's say the onboarding flow together with the you know dashboard of your product first, and then you will start changing the main product experience uh, uh, a few weeks later, and it's painful because. For a, a period of time, you have an inconsistent experience. You have things that look slightly off in that part of the product compared to that other part of the product. But we found that to be the best way to just do a redesign without affecting product velocity and and you know without you know preventing you to, from still creating customer value. Because if you're a small team, a redesign will probably slow down this the space at which you are shipping other things. Um, so that's kind of like what we found to work best is to do it in a in a modular fashion. But I'm conscious it might not work for every product and for every organization, of course. Yeah, it's a tricky one. And, and for me, first of all, I think it's important to do it. I know it's scary. I know it's painful. I know it's risky. But the cost of not doing it and getting exactly. stuck, it's higher, in my opinion. Um, and I also have experience that it usually comes from a CEO or, or an executive. Uh, it's not common that a designer or another person would say, we need to redesign the whole thing. Like there has to be some top-down support, but obviously you're also going to find some friction because there are always going to be people saying, well, but what we have already works, but I'm already working on other priorities. So I think negotiating internally the actual value versus cost equation is very, very important because uh, if you start a project without people really believing in the success of the project, it's probably going to fail. Actually, that's funny you mentioned that because you know in our own team, it was typically our, our head of design that was advocating for those redesign moments. Whenever he, whenever he realized, okay, this is this is no longer good enough for what we want to provide customers. So it it made our, our life easier that the you know the head of design was the one driving that project forward and not just me being the annoying CEO. <laughs> yeah. So how do you learn these days? Um, well, what do you mean? Always speak to customers. You are, <laughs> tell me more about, about that and how you structure your time to have enough time to, to interact with customers. Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned, we just got, we just joined forces with with uh, with Miro. So there's still a, a lot to learn uh, before to just start pinging their customers. But like on, on the wizard front, I still try to just have you know face-to-face -face time with customers once a week to make sure that, you know, okay, what are, are the core problems? What are you not able to solve the product? What can we improve the product? And when I don't have calls in in the calendar, um, I, I find it quite fascinating to just go read, you know, customer support tickets, uh, or we, you know, we have surveys for, for NPS that we send to 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 customers, and you know, you can see every single day, okay, what are these cohorts struggling with? What is not clear to this type of people? And so I would say, like, the biggest learning beyond just, of course, quantitative data and tracking on your product is literally just speaking with 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 people. You know, I've, I've been doing this podcast for over five years, so I hosted incredible founders and product executives. And I always joke, I ask the questions that I really care about. And, and this one about how as someone learn is very important to me. And uh, I've seen a consistent theme around spending time to talk to customers or uh, advisors or people outside the, the, the core team, outside the org. Um, the follow-up question here is, okay, when you identify certain insights and your companies has a meaningful size where you are not just the only product person in the org that is going to bring an idea and the idea is going to be done. Well, you actually have to also uh, incorporate something to other people's ideas. Like, how do you go about really bringing those type of insights and ensuring that they are perceived as, hey, CEO actually is, is, is bringing something, not just because he had a shower idea, but because there is something here in addition to what are all other people. And, and, and you get rightly prioritize. It's not just, oh my God, it's a CEO idea. Let's put it as priority number zero. No, that's, that's a good point. And, and that's something I've tried to be better over time is not to distract the team. And so what, like initially, of course, I, I was pretty bad at it. I'm going to be honest. You know, I would, I would just send all the ideas on Slack and then we just will brainstorming, we will we'll brainstorm them the following uh, weekly uh, workshop. But like recently, what I found to be valuable is like whenever there is an insight with one customer, two customers, is to try to just validate it with with as many as mo as many more data points as possible. If one per one customer feels this way, and I, I have a strong gut feeling it might be the case, I'll try to validate it with five, six, ten other customers. And if I can't get hold of customers, or is a really cryptic thing, 
can we actually find inside of our product data some patterns su suggesting that indeed this is a problem or indeed this is something that's that's worth investigating more time. And, and I would do this first before distracting the team, which is like whenever I have a high intuition that is the right thing to do and there's data to back it up, then then it, it it's probably something we should we should prioritize. Tony, it's been a pleasure to have you on the on the podcast and, and learn more about how you're thinking about product design, about about the future, incorporating AI, especially because you've been building on AI before it was cool. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thanks, Carlos, for having me. Take care.